for this evening service and we're going to begin with um, some words from the prophet Isaiah Isaiah writes it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and many people shall come to it and say come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob for out of Zion shall go the law and the word of God from Jerusalem. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. And we're going to sing together now a paraphrase of that passage, number 564. Behold the mountain of the Lord in latter days shall rise. 564. Now let's pray together. The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. 
He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Father, we praise you for the assurance of the coming kingdom and the coming king, the light that shines in the dark places of the world and in the dark places of our lives. We know that you know us better than we know ourselves. Your eyes see into our most secret hearts, showing us what we are, showing us our sinfulness, and yet calling us in love to turn from them and to follow you all the days of our lives. Father, we thank you for this new opportunity to meet, to hear your word, to praise your name, and to meet with you. Father, we pray that you will give us open hearts, you will give us listening ears. We pray that as we sing together, as we pray together, and as we talk with one another, and above all, as we open your word, that you will indeed speak into the deepest places of our hearts. Father, we know that we are sinners. We know all about our harsh words and cowardly silences, all about our indifference to those far away, and often our impatience with those near at hand. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, welcome once again, whichever part of the building you're in, and a particular welcome if you're visiting. Trust that you will enjoy the experience of praising God and listening to his word together. And there will be um, coffee and tea served downstairs on, uh, it says in Campsy, I presume that's the, the room rather than the hills. My suggestion of naming these rooms after Narnia characters was not followed, I... <laughs> I would have to say. Anyway, one or two, one or two other announcements. Wednesday, uh, sorry, Monday is before Wednesday, is it not? I'm not even very good at announcements when they're on a sheet. But um, Monday at 11 o'clock, um, the ladies' Bible study here in Bath Street. On Wednesday, there's no lunchtime talk or prayer meeting. Following Wednesday, the 18th, both of these will happen again. Friday at 9.30am, Ladies Bible Study with Kresh, also here at Bath Street. Then Activate and Tron Youth at 5pm on Friday, and dinner served from 5.30pm. And if you don't already have one of these calendars about our Gospel partners, they're still available. Um, Paul said this morning there was hardly any available, so I imagine there'll be even fewer this evening, but you can still pick one up. The price of two pounds. Now, Paul, you're going to tell us about something. Up as I did this morning, um, the Life Explored course, which we are running here, starting on Thursday, the 19th of uh, January, uh, which is Thursday week. Um, there should be a, plenty of these flyers outside. They're on the seats this morning. Um, but do be thinking of folk that you might be able to invite and to bring along uh, to that course. It's a new course, and it's produced by the folk that put together Christianity Explored. And the purpose of this course is to introduce people to the Lord Jesus, and to do so through exposing the sort of things that we tend to strive after in life. So it looks at money and power and success, those sorts of things that people tend to want to find fulfillment in, and it tries to get under the skin of that and to try and expose the things that people tend to strive after, and through doing that, to show them that the only other way that we can find true fulfillment is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And they do that through a series of short uh, video clips, which uh, tell stories which are designed to expose these gods that we tend to seek after, and there's time to discuss, and there's time 
for Bible teaching in the second of the videos. I'm going to show a trailer in a moment, so which gives you little clips from each of the films that are in the, in the course. And as you'll see, it's a very well put together series. They spend a lot of time and effort pulling together these videos. It's good quality. And uh, if you bring somebody along to it, you can have great confidence that this will be uh, a helpful thing for them to do. So let's just watch this together for a moment, and then I'll just give one or two more details in a second. So each evening over the seven weeks uh, begins with a meal at seven o'clock, a bit of time to chat together over food, and then the evening will begin with watching the first of the videos, a bit of time to discuss, and then the second video, which contains some teaching from the Bible, and then further chance to discuss. It really is aimed at those who really have very little understanding of uh, the Bible, of Christianity, and uh, it's very accessible to anyone that might want to come along. So do be thinking of friends, family that you might be able to bring along. And also think about coming along yourself. Uh, it's a new course and we're just beginning to get familiar with it. So it might be a real benefit just to come along and see what it's like so that you might in future be able to bring someone along knowing a bit more about it. So do have a think about that. Do grab one of these little invite cards and think about who you could perhaps bring along. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Now we're going to we're going to sing again number six hundred and twenty six hundred and twenty five. Tell out sorry, six hundred and twenty eight. Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord, unnumbered blessings give my spirit voice.
now we come to our Bible reading, and we're returning to the occasional series on the book of Isaiah. We began that last summer, and various points throughout the year have looked at it, and we've reached page 585, chapter 24 of the book, and we're going to read chapters 24 and 25. Now, I hope you have on your seats one of these sheets, which is a a kind of ladybird guide to the, to, to the book of Isaiah. No one will thank me for spending half an hour um, summarizing chapters 1 to 23. I'm not intending to do that. Simply to point out where we've reached. If you look down towards the bottom of the sheet, I try to divide the book into five major sections. I mean, we're in section 2, chapters 13 to 27, which essentially is about God and the nations, and indeed the whole universe. On chapter 24, we reach the point where Isaiah has been addressing specific nations. Now he's talking about the whole world, indeed the whole created order. So we're going to read chapters 24 and 25, bearing that in mind. Chapter 24. Behold, the Lord will empty the earth and make it desolate. And he will twist its surface and scatter its inhabitants. And it shall be, as with the people, so with the priest. As with the slave, so with his master. As with the maid, so with her mistress. As with the buyer, so with the seller. As with the lender, so with the borrower. As with the creditor, so with the debtor. The earth shall be utterly empty and utterly plundered. For the Lord has spoken this word. The earth mourns and withers, the world languishes and withers. The highest people of the earth languish. The earth lies defiled under its inhabitants. For they have transgressed the laws, violated the statutes, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore a curse devours the earth, and its inhabitants suffer for their guilt. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are scorched, and few men are left. The wine mourns, the vine languishes, all the merry-hearted sigh. Mirth of the tambourines is still, the noise of the jubilant has ceased. The mirth of the lyre is stilled. No more do they drink wine with singing. Strong drink is bitter to those who drink it. The wasted city is broken down. Every house is shut up so that no one can enter. There's an outcry in the streets for lack of wine. All joy has grown dark. The gladness of the earth is banished. Desolation is left in the city. The gates are battered into ruins. Well, as it shall be in the midst of the earth among the nations, as when an olive tree is beaten, as at the gleaning when the great harvest is done. They lift up their voices. They sing for joy. Over the majesty of the Lord, they shout from the west. Therefore, in the east, give glory to the Lord. In the coastlands of the sea, give glory to the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. From the ends of the earth, we hear songs of praise, of glory to the righteous one. But I say, I waste away. I waste away. Woe is me, for the traitors have betrayed. With betrayal, the traitors have betrayed. Terror and the pit and the snare are upon you, O inhabitant of the earth. He who flees at the sound of the terror shall fall into the pit, and he who climbs out of the pit shall be caught in the snare. For the windows of heaven are opened, and the foundations of the earth tremble. The earth is utterly broken, the earth is split apart, the earth is violently shaken, the earth staggers like a drunken man, it sways like a hut. Its transgression lies heavy upon it, and it falls and will not rise again. On that day the Lord will punish the host of heaven in heaven and the kings of the earth on the earth. They will be gathered together as prisoners in a pit. They will be shut up in a prison, and after many days they will be punished. Then the moon will be confounded and the sun ashamed, for the Lord of hosts reigns on Mount Zion, and in Jerusalem, that his glory will be before his elders. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things. 
lands formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin. The foreigner's palace is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear. For you have been a stronghold to the poor, a stronghold to the needy in his distress, a strength from the storm and a shade from the heat. And the breath of the ruthless is like a storm against a wall, like heat in a dry place. You subdue the noise of the foreigners as heat by the shade of a cloud, so the song of the ruthless is put down. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined, and he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For the hand of the Lord will rest on this mountain, and Moab shall be trampled down in his place, as straw is trampled down in a dunghill. And he will spread out his hands in the midst of it, as a swimmer spreads his hands out to swim. But the Lord will lay low his pompous pride together with the skill of his hands and the high fortifications of his wall, he will bring down, lay low, and cast to the ground, to the dust. Amen. This is the word of the Lord, and may he bless it to our hearts and our minds. Now, we're going to sing once again, number 950, Judge Eternal, Throned in Splendor, a hymn about uh, praying that God will have mercy on us as a nation and as a people, Judge Eternal, Throned in Splendor. Now, as the musicians play, we're going to take up the offering.
Well, let's pray. King David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty, for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. But who am I and what are my people that we should be able thus to offer you willingly? For all things come from you, and of your own have we given you. As we have laid our offerings before you, we thank you that this is another opportunity for us who have nothing to give back to you something of the gifts you have given us. And we pray they will be used for your glory, the building up of your kingdom here and in many other places. And at this time of year, as schools, as schools, colleges, universities begin, we pray particularly for our young people and other young people, and we pray for the many things that are done in your name. Pray for Christian unions. We pray for release the word. We pray for Cornhill about to begin again tomorrow, and for the the many, many activities that from the small children, the creche, to students. And we pray, Lord, that in all these things your name will be honoured, your kingdom advanced, and that your w- w- word will be obeyed. And we pray indeed for all of us in this new week. Each of us have things we're looking forward to and things we want to avoid. Each of us... Um, don't know what the future will hold. And so we pray we may approach it in your hands and under your care. O God, the strength of all those who put their trust in you, mercifully accept our prayers. And because through the weakness of our mortal nature, we can do nothing good without you, grant us your grace that in keeping your commandments we may please you both in will and in deed, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, before we look together at the Scriptures, we're going to sing 546. God has spoken, and God is still speaking. God has spoken by his prophets.
Now, could I ask you please to have your Bibles open at page 585, and we'll have a moment of prayer. Father, your word speaks to us in many ways, in many voices, and we pray, Lord, that as we open that word now, that you will take my human words and all their imperfections, that you will use them faithfully to unfold the written word, and so lead us to the living word, the Lord Christ himself, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now, at this time of year, there are innumerable articles in magazines and newspapers on, and online giving predictions for what the year is going to hold. One or two titles, seven MPs to watch out for. Not to watch out for because they were likely to, to be deceptive, to watch out for because they'd like to make an impact. Six predictions about the economy. These kind of, these kind of um, predictions, which every year at this time are made, and you can be certain of, of one thing above everything else. If any of these predictions are fulfilled, the writers of the article will be very quick to remind us that you read it first here. And if none of them are fulfilled, then the writers of the same article will probably keep it from us and pretend they never wrote them because human beings cannot predict the future, because events are always overtaking us. Former Prime Minister Harold Macmillan was asked, what's the most difficult thing about being Prime Minister? And he replied, events, dear boy, events. Now we know that's true in our own lives, circumstances over which we have no control. And therefore, although these predictions may be interesting, and though occasionally they may score a bullseye, for most of the time, they are simply speculation. Now, what we have in the, this passage we read is an absolutely certain prediction of what is going to happen. Isaiah is not a political columnist. He's not a foreign correspondent. He is saying, this is going to happen, and it's going to happen because the Lord has decided it will happen. The Lord has spoken the word, and because he has spoken the word, it will happen. And the phrase we've often noticed in Isaiah occurs again, on that day. And that day is the final day, the final day when all the provisional verdicts will be set aside, when history will come to a close and the kingdom will be established. Now, there's two notes struck here in these chapters. First of all, the earth is shaken in judgment. That's mainly, but not entirely, chapter 24. And the earth is blessed by salvation, mainly chapter 25. These are going to be our two main points tonight. The earth shaken in judgment and the earth blessed in salvation. This is a tremendous poem, picture piled upon picture. Or to use another metaphor, this is a great symphony. Isaiah has been described as the great symphony of salvation, the various notes, the blending together to create this. Rather like what the poet Blake said, when you see the sunrise, do you see a golden disc like a coin? Or do you see a multitude of the heavenly host calling, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty? As Isaiah looked into the future, and as he talked about the effects of the future in the present, he saw the equivalent of a multitude of the heavenly hosts singing, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. That's the first thing, the two notes, judgment and salvation. And the second thing is, the whole earth, and indeed it's wider than the earth because this is the whole universe, the sky, the world, and the underworld, and so on, are symbolized by two cities. There is the wasted city of 2410. The wasted city is broken down. Verse 12, desolation is left in the city. And then there is Zion, city of our God, 25.6, on this mountain, that is the mountain of Zion. And indeed, it's the story of the world. 
That's why our title tonight is A Tale of Two Cities. That's what biblical history is about. The city of the world, symbolized by Babylon, and the city of God, symbolized by Zion. Now, it's not just the two literal cities. It's the, what John calls the world, which passes away, and the people of God, the city of God. That's what we're going to be looking at the next moment. So first of all then, the earth shaken in judgment. You'll notice the agent is the Lord himself. Behold, the Lord will empty the earth and make it desolate. Verse 1 and then verse 3, the earth shall be utterly empty and utterly plunder for the Lord has spoken this word. Just as in the creation story, God spoke and there was light and life. And so in judgment, he speaks once again, symbolized in the book of Revelation by the sharp sword that comes out of his mouth. His purpose is nothing less than the creation of a new heaven and a new earth. This is what Isaiah is about. So two things here. First of all, the total destruction of evil. Now, I'm not going to go into this chapter in detail. There's a tremendous amount in it. It's worth, it's worth studying. And I, I already recommended the late Alec Motier's daily devotional guide to Isaiah. It's in the book room, Ag. Good. It's in the book room, thanks. So you can get it there. And it's a series of readings. Alec Motier spent a lifetime on Isaiah. We've got the digest here, also one on the Psalms. These were the last two books he wrote before he went to be with the Lord a month or two ago, the age of 91. Um, Paul was talking this morning about Joshua being old and advanced in years and still had worked to do well. Motier was writing up to the age of 91. So that's good, wonderful. So there will be a total destruction of evil. Would you like to live in a world without war, without terrorism, without illness, without oppression, without poverty, and above all, without death? The answer to that is obvious. That is the kind of world we all want to live in. And we know perfectly well that is not the kind of world we live in now. And therefore, these things have to be removed. They have to be judged before that world can come. The removal of the curse, verse 6, therefore a curse devours the earth. That takes us back to the beginning of our Bibles, Genesis 3. The, the Lord smites the earth, indeed the universe, with a curse because of the sinfulness of humanity. <clears throat> and notice how at the beginning of the chapter verses verse 2 all of society all classes of society are involved the people the priest the buyer the seller the creditor and the debtor every section of society is involved just as in the awesome picture at the end of revelation of the great white throne john says i saw the dead great and small stand before God. No one's too important to be there. No one is too insignificant to be there. And so it is here. And why is this happening? Because verse 5, they have transgressed the laws, violated the statutes, broken the everlasting covenant. Everlasting covenant was God, creation of the world by God to be the theater of his glory. And after the flood, he renews that covenant with Noah. And that's very important. God intends to create a new heaven and a new earth. And, because, and all pleasure is gone. Now, it's very interesting here. Many of the things which are said not to be there any longer are also things which appear on Mount Zion in the positive picture of salvation. The Bible does not talk about disembodied existence in a shadow land. We are in the shadow land at the moment. And when we think of the world to come, we must take all the different pictures the Bible has. We still often tend to think of it simply as endless singing. Well, thank you very much. I think even the Hallelujah Chorus would wear thin after a hundred years. None of us want an eternity um, sitting on clouds, um, strumming harps. That's only one picture. Of course there will be praise in the new creation. But then there's other pictures as well, and we'll look, at, um, we'll look at that in chapter 25 and in other chapters 
in other chapters later on. And you'll notice as well in verse 19, and sorry, verse um, 18, first of all, the windows of heaven are opened, the foundations of the earth tremble. This is imagery drawn from the flood story in Genesis. And that's exactly what Peter says in his second letter, that when the final judgment comes, it will be like the flood. People, people just be behaving as normal. And then the final judgment comes. Peter said, where is this coming that he promised? Well, Peter says, when he, ju- when he comes to judge, it will be known. There's one little other detail I want you to notice in verse um, 10. The wasted city is broken down. This word wasted is the word that's used in Genesis 1 verse 2 of the desolation that hovered over the earth before God spoke the great creating word, let there be light, and brought light and order and beauty and life in, into the world. The hint here surely is that just as in Genesis at the beginning, when he created the heavens and earth, he's going to do exactly the same again at the end. There will be a new creation. Total destruction of evil, which is necessary for that good creation to happen. You can't have the good creation when death reigns, when terrorism flourishes, when hopelessness and depression and all the other things are there. So the total destruction of evil. The other thing I want you to notice in the chapter, I'm sure you notice as we're reading it, the apparent um, incongruity of verses 14 to 16. There's all this, and then suddenly breaking into song. They lift up their voices. They sing for joy. You'll notice, first of all, it's a worldwide song. Shout from the west, in the east, the coastlands of the sea. The coastlands are islands, a favorite word of Isaiah, as he begins, the prophets begin to look westward as they, see the, as they see the work of God is going to flourish in the lands of the Mediterranean. That is exactly where, of course, the New Testament is going to take us. Now, what is the point of this? Praise anticipates the new creation. When God's people sing his praises on earth, it's a statement of faith. When we, I mean... When we sing in, at the end of the service, Christ is surely coming, bringing his reward. He doesn't look any evidence of that in the world today, is there? It's a statement of faith, it's an anticipating of the crea- new creation. It's said that during the Civil War of the 17th century, when Cromwell's Ironsides raised their psalms, the cavaliers trembled. I don't think it's fanciful to imagine the principalities and powers of that dark empire tremble when they hear the triumph of Jesus celebrated. So I say to him, hates it. Read Revelation 12 and 13. He is furious. He is cast down to the earth because Christ has won and Christ will win at the end. And he will subdue all his enemies. Verse 21, the enemies in heaven, the principalities and powers, Satan himself. Self, enemies on earth, and he will reign. The moon will be confounded, the sun ashamed, for the Lord of hosts reigns. A poetic, a poetic description of the glory of the new creation. And notice the end of verse, his glory will be before his elders, the elders representing all of God's people. As they do in Revelation, where we have the thrones of the elders before the throne of, before the throne of God. All the people of God. And that brings a transition to chapter 25. The earth shaken in judgment, totally shaken, evil vanished, uh, evil banished, Satan defeated, and the reign of death and sin ended. <coughs> And that brings us on to chapter 25, the earth blessed by salvation, a song of praise. Now, this isn't just an intellectual idea, is it? Because, after all, we have to ask ourselves, can God deliver on his promises? Because the promises are so wonderful, so breathtaking, so extravagant even. Has he promised things he can't deliver? And this is what this um, chapter is answering. First of all, what kind of a God is he? Is he a God who is able to subdue everything and bring about his kingdom? Well, first of all, verses 1 to 5 
He is a God of surprises. You have done wonderful things. A deliberate echo of of the song of Moses in Exodus 15. You, I will exalt you. I will praise your name. And when you study the hymns and songs of the Bible, you often find this deeply personal on Isaiah's part, but also echoing the great, uh, the great words of the past as well. Just as in the song of Mary that we sang, Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord, the Magnificat, in Luke 2. Mary is deeply personal in her feeling, but she is also echoing the words of the Old Testament prophets. And you know, it's so important... One of the things, I'm so often struck by the thinness and poverty of my language. And that's where we need to draw on the resources of the church in the past and in the present. In the case of either the past or the present, there was good things written in the past, there was rubbish written in the past, just as much as now. But you joining, if you like, with the saints throughout the ages... And not least, of course, above all, with the Psalms themselves and other, other prayers and songs that have been written and are still being written. See, it's new, but it's consistent with his age-old purpose. And that's the wonderful thing about God. God is totally consistent, and yet he is always new. A new commandment, as Jesus talks about, And yet it's not a new commandment, it's the old commandment. It comes with freshness and power. Sing a new song to the Lord, as the Psalms say. Not a new song in the sense we've invented a new God, but that the power and wonder of this God has become real to us. So when the city of the world goes, what will happen? You have been a stronghold to the poor, stronghold to the needy in his distress, a shelter from the storm, a shade from the heat from the breath of the ruthless. This is, this is God. This is the kind of God he is. He isn't just power. He is tenderness as well. That is the characteristic of the God of Scripture, isn't it? You get some, in most pagan religions, the gods are either all-powerful or else they're totally fickle and untrustworthy. No, this God... Give salvation to the poor, to the weak, and to the needy. Who are the poor, the weak, and the needy? All of us. Because we all are poor without the gospel. We all are weak in ourselves. We are all needy. So first of all, he's a God of surprises. Secondly, he is a generous host. Verses 6 to 8. There's another picture of a new creation. A marvelous party, a banquet with no expense spared. And that's, that's developed elsewhere in Scripture. Isaiah is to speak about this in chapter 55. Come and wine and milk without money and without price. And Jesus is to tell many parables of the great banquet on Mount Zion. Now, Mount Zion here is not just the hill on which Jerusalem stands. It's the whole earth. Rather, as at the end of the Bible, the holy city coming down out from God, from heaven, is not um, an entity, if you like, in the new creation. It's the new creation itself from a different angle. And we mustn't be super spiritual and explain away these words as meaning we'll all be full of joy. You know, it's rather, rather like kind of ridiculous, rather like the kind of ridiculous thing that, that some liberals say about the parables. Jesus did not turn water into wine. He made everybody feel so glad and so joyful that they, that they thought the, the water tasted like good wine. Now, frankly, that is not the gospel. That is sentimentality. Yeah, Jesus who makes us feel good, so we go and we make others feel good. Or rather like, I've heard it said, you know, when Jesus fed the 5,000, a little boy brought his picnic lunch. Now, boys and girls, are you going to give your lunch to Jesus? I remember even when I heard that as a boy, I thought that was ridiculous. Did the one who created out of nothing need my picnic basket? That's surely not the point of the story. The point of the story is, rather, that however little we have, God can make it into a feast. Good food, good drink, great company, wonderful. 
not, as I say, disembodied existence in a shadow land, but a new creation. And notice verse um, 8, he will swallow up death forever. Now, in the Canaanite religion, which often proved such a great temptation to the Jewish people, it was fought against particularly by the prophet Elijah, there was a god called Mot, who was the swallower, whose jaws stretched from heaven to earth and swallowed up everything that came into his devouring jaws. Here the swallower will be swallowed. Paul says, death is swallowed up in victory. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Death is ruthless. Death is indiscriminate. Death respects no one and nothing. But I want you particularly to to notice the second part of verse 8. The Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. In the middle of Revelation, John picks up this phrase. Notice exactly what it says. It doesn't say no one will cry anymore. It says he will wipe away tears from all faces. The tenderness of the Lord. The personal touch. And I think this is so, this is so wonderful. And the reproach, I imagine here, the reproach of his people, is the sinfulness of his people, which has caused such a stumbling block often. As you know, very often we ourselves can be a great stumbling block to the gospel because we're not very good examples of it. Well, that will be taken away. He is a God of surprises. He is an utterly generous host. <clears throat> and the no expense spared. And of course, that has a much deeper meaning. No expense was spared. The expense was the blood of Jesus, was it not? <laughs> And finally, verses 9 to 12, he will complete his work. It will be said on that day. You see, we often pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I wonder if we really believe that's going to happen. I I said it is going to happen. We have waited for him. In the great 40th chapter, he's going to say those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Paul is to talk about those who love the Lord's appearing. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. That's the word for now. But, as I say, this is anticipating victory. The hymn we often sing says, When the road is steep, the road is long, steals on our ear the distant triumph song. And that's anticipating that. But on that day, the whole universe will burst into joy. Some of the Psalms express Psalm 98, the rivers will clap their hands, the trees of the field will rejoice, and the whole of creation will be what God intended it to be. But there's a dark side to judgment, represented here by Moab, one of the petty kingdoms who is a continual thorn in the flesh to Israel, proud and rebellious Moab. That will be laid low. But the city of God is secure while the city of the world is destroyed. Does that mean there's no hope for Moab? Does that mean if you're a Moabite, you are completely cut off from the kingdom of God? Think about that bright name that resounds down in the scripture of Ruth. Who was Ruth? She was a Moabite, was she not? And she appears in the New Testament in the first chapter of Matthew as the ancestress of David himself. Moab can be saved, but Moab can only be saved if it turns in repentance and humility to Israel's God. There is hope for the whole world if the whole world will come in repentance and faith. God's city remains. God's city will stand. And remember, of course, God's city is not just something that's going to happen in the future. It's there already, long, long ago. What did Abraham do? He set out in faith, looking, as the letter to Hebrews says, for a city which has foundations, whose builder and architect is God. In other words, the city was already there when Abraham traveled towards it. It will only be fully revealed at the end of the story. Prophet Isaiah is saying, is he not? God will be God. 
and the world will know it. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, it's so difficult sometimes in the troubles and frankly in the grey, dull days of our lives to keep our eye on this, the holy city. We pray indeed that you will give to us faith and courage and vision, the faith that our eyes at last shall see him through his own redeeming love. And we pray indeed that that may brighten the journey and may give us cause, even in this world, to anticipate that day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, to the glory of your name. Amen. And so to our final hymn, which is 506, Christ is surely coming bringing his reward, number 506. Apostle John wrote, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is with humans. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. And until that day, 
May the love of the Lord Jesus draw us to himself. May the power of the Lord Jesus strengthen us in his service. May the joy of the Lord Jesus fill our hearts and bring us in the light of grace to the light of glory.